we are virtual. We are very happy to be able to use this platform to bring us all together and strengthen our sense of community during these challenging times. We have a wonderful group of speakers and performers here with us today that you'll have a chance to hear throughout the event. Before we get started, there's a few housekeeping items that we will take care of. Uh, first and foremost, this event is being recorded. We ask that everyone keep their video turned off for this event. The speakers will be turning on their video at their designated times. This will ensure there's no connection disruptions, and we will also ask that you change your view from seeing everyone in the grid-like manner to the speaker view. Speaker view enables the speaker to be the only image on your screen. That way your focus is where it should be during the remaining of the event. We are asking that everyone please keep their mics muted. Speakers and performers will be muted for their, unmuted for their portions. We ask that if everyone stays muted, we won't have to worry about any accidental disruptions as well. If you have any questions during this event, please direct them to the chat tab at the bottom of your computer screen. Your host will respond or redirect questions to speakers at appropriate times. This event does cover some sensitive content and we are aware that the content can be triggering to some. We want to ensure all participants that this is a safe and respectful event. Please be respectful to all speakers and viewers. This includes keeping mics muted, uh, speaking in turn, being aware of our space that we're sharing. We also encourage all participants to smudge, hold your bundle close, and have your rattles and drums on hand. This will connect us during the event as well. Last but not least, if you have a candle or you've created a red dress to hang in your window today, please use the hashtag SISV2020 to share it with us on social media. We look forward to seeing how our community has come together for our missing and murdered loved ones. To open today's event, Paige and Sarah are going to begin with a group drum song. This will be followed by the All Nations drum. I'm also singing wolf and I took bear and the wolf clan uh teacher of the clan from Swan River, Manitoba. I'm Cree and Soto. And I'm honored to be here to drum today for the Sisters and Spirit event today. Thank you for having me. I'm Paige Glenn. Okay, I guess we're just going to go ahead and sing. <laughs> okay. We start with Brenda's healing. So. Yeah. 
cool movie. Look at When is it, when do you watch the dance? You know, yeah, it's three, I think. Mm -hmm. do strong women? Strong women? Okay, we'll do strong women. <laughs> Sarah for your beautiful song. Up next we are going to have a performance by All Nations Drums. So Kevin if you and your group would like to begin the floor is yep. yours. So good evening everybody. My name is Kevin Myron Dakota from Birchdale, Manitoba. Currently working at Toronto Council Affairs, YLP uh, youth worker. We're uh, very honored to uh, uh, sing for this event. Our, our juniors come out every year, right? And uh, we support you guys when you guys do it in the park. Um, you guys heard earlier that if you have your rattle, okay, bust them out. If you have your drums, bust them out. The idea behind behind this rattle, right, is that's the sound of creation, right? When you rattle that sound, right, you bring in that sound of creation. We're asking for creation, right, to be to, to, to be with our women, you know, the women that are missing, you know, the families, you know, to uh, try to keep those girls safe. So that's the idea of what having the rattles. So we're going to do a, um, what you call a grand entry song, right? And uh, I shook that rattle and hope that our ancestors are with us today. Voice. Hey! <laughs> 
Thank you for that beautiful song. We will have um, some more from the All Nations Drum Group as we move through today's event. But at this time, I would like to introduce one of the Native Women's Resource Center of Toronto's traditional healers, Blue Spirit Eagle, Bear Wolf Clan member, Marianne Shoefly. Marianne, the floor is yours. Marianne, you're muted, so just unmute yourself, okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay, hello. Can you hear me now? Okay, I'm guessing. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, some awesome singing there. Uh, thank you to the group, um, Sarah, as well as Paige. Um, always nice to hear those songs. Um, I cracked out my rattle uh, while the ladies were singing. And um, yeah, so I guess here we are. Um, I'd like to take a moment to, um, whenever I go out and speak out um, in, in other spots, in other places. Let's see. Get the hang going here for a second. Um, instead of, uh, and I've been asked to uh, do prayers and such, um, and, and that's all great and that's all wonderful and like, everybody does their own thing. Um, but for me, um, as I have, have shared this with other people in the past and other groups, um, it's easy to pay for somebody to pray for you. Um, praying for yourself, um, that's a different story. So anyhow, um, what I've learned over the years um, to include everybody, and it's really kind of about opening space and holding space, um, and that is hopefully what it is that we're doing today, um, is creating that space um, for those feelings and emotions, um, those thoughts, those memories, those people, for prayers, prayers for a missing, prayers for our loved ones, prayers for those that have gone on, um, prayers of comfort, the family members, um, as well as, as sisters and community members. And so um, in keeping with the time of the year, lots of rain around, if you've noticed, I know I'm up um, in the bush, so just up near Owen Sound. So also I know that it's raining down um, as well in your way as well. So there was something, sorry, I had this all planned out. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is, um, if all of you uh, who are who are listening, um, if you can just sit for a minute, I'm going to look at the clock. I didn't recognize it; it was behind me. Um, but I'm going to ask you to hold a moment of silence. Um, and typically, what I do, as I said, in the greater community, um, is I've asked people to hold silence for two minutes, similar to um, Remembrance Day. Um, and the reason for that, and the reason um, the two minutes, is that um, during that time, um, if you have any understanding or um, any teachings around holding space, um, it's really, really important um, because we are a lot of, of energy work, energy and a lot of energy work. This is what this, this space is all about. So as I mentioned, it's easy um, to ask people to do that for you. Um, it's always welcome and it's always supportive. Um, but it also makes a difference when you're able to um, pray for yourself as well. Um, and the reason that I bring this exercise out into the greater community, because we, we don't assume that everybody understands what prayers are. Um, I don't assume that everybody understands what that is. Um, it is very different things to everybody. Um, and I'm just only one person that speaks only on my own behalf um, and my own background, and my own spirituality in terms of this kind of work. So I just, however that works for you um, and how you choose to do that, that's great. Um, but during this time, I'm gonna ask you to just put your things down, close your eyes, um, sit still, and we're gonna hold space for two minutes for all those that have been murdered and, missing, and are missing, um, as well as the family members. And if we can all sort of pull this energy together for a couple of minutes, um, I'll, I will start it um, and then I'll let you know. Um, and during this time, it's, as I said, it's completely up to you how you want to spend that time, um, this two minutes. Um, and it's all great. The prayers will all come together. And so um, 
Sorry, there's lots of ums. It's, it's always different when you get on here at the beginning, right? The first couple of minutes, you're like, blah, blah, blah. But anyhow, sorry. So if I'm saying a lot of ums, I'm working on it, um, <laughs> except for right now. Okay, so in about three seconds, if you just wanted to close your eyes, hold your smudge, start your smudge, if this is the time that you want to do it. If you do want to rattle while you're doing it, that's great. Um, as I mentioned, um, our brothers are earlier about holding that rattle and creation and bringing it in, just bring it all in. So for the next two minutes and three seconds, I will let, you're going to hold silence and I'll let you know when the two minutes is done. So three, two, one, and here we go. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I thank everybody for the introductions. Um, we often forget some things, um, as I mentioned, when you're when you're up speaking and you're aware uh, that that they're uh, either you're on video or even these Zoom things. Um, but one of the things is that. Um, introducing yourself is a really really big part um, like obviously of who you are and especially in this work and just that I have a tendency to just focus on the work and the, what it is that I'm doing anybody that knows me I don't get caught up in titles I don't get caught up in letters or anything like that I just have difficulty and work really hard at trying to be Marianne in my day job um, this is where the healing part comes in and so my job, my number one responsibility um, and carrying that responsibility is, is what they call ethics and it's called the, and your integrity. And what I mean by that is my job is to one, um, look after myself and ensure that I'm healthy as possible as best as I can be, um, to be honest about the information that I'm being, bringing forward, uh, to be responsible about it as well, but also to know who that I am uh, accountable to. And so from my understanding, there's what we have um, in place is what's called in English, the Universal Code of Ethics, um, number one. Um, you can Google that, imagine, uh, because it is out there as well. It's been out there for about a good 30, 40, probably 50 years that I'm aware of. Um, I have seen a copy of it. Um, but also in the teachings that I've been taught over the years is also the understanding around the universal truths is what they call it in English. Um, but it's similar. And what it is, is that um, I did a paper in university one time matching up the social work code of ethics with the traditional code of ethics. And even though there's only 10 that are listed in the traditional code of ethics, I was able to go through um, the social work code of ethics and able to um, a parallel which of those ethics um, went together and of course with the with the social work code of ethics I'm just giving you an example um, they're expanded so there was like more to it more details to it as with the traditional code of ethics um, again this is only one example um, there was only 10 that were listed and they were pretty simple and pretty clear so as you can see in the difference, right? 
So anyways, um, what I'm trying to say is that each time that I go into any kind of a ceremony, whether it's just an exchange with somebody, whether it's just uh, a conversation, um, whether it's a smudge, whether it's, um, you know, actually doing an on the land ceremony or whether it's doing sweats, whatever it is that you want to call it and opening all of it from what I, I was told, um, it's about your intention. So in order for me to prep when I go in to do these particular things, uh, my number one responsibility is safety, which means that every person that is sitting within that circle or is going to attend or um, participate, um, it's my job is to ensure the whole entire thing from beginning to end um, is safe. And that's it. That's a big enough responsibility to carry. I don't want anybody else's responsibilities. I have enough to do for myself. And so when we come together to do these kinds of things, you may not see a lot of this stuff that's going on behind the scenes, as, um, as I'm sure that you've heard other teachings. Um, but at the same time, we know that there's a lot more to it than just goes to what you actually will physically see in the end of it. And so what I tell people is that the minute that we finish a ceremony, for example, um, a, a tent, um, as soon as that, that last prayer goes in to, to complete that particular ceremony, the next one already starts. So for example, we might have about a month or 30 days in between. Um, from the minute that that other one finishes, the next one starts. And that includes all of the preparation. So this is what goes into um, the ceremonies that, that we do here at Native Women's. Um, and I just wanted to mention that. The other thing is um, in doing these ceremonies to date and currently, uh, this was a process of where we're going on almost three years. We're coming up to three years uh, and doing these ceremonies. And so it wasn't something that just kind of anybody decided to get up one morning and all of a sudden, well, that sounds like a good idea. Let's go and do that. No, this had to do with three years and we did open it. We had opened it up to the community and, and it was invited. It was interactive in English. It was interactive. Um, and so, and, and it was just open. And because we wanted to show people what it was that we're doing from beginning to end. Uh, my understanding and the teaching that I received that anybody that does perform um, and provide any type of ceremony, uh, you have a responsibility to know all of the parts and pieces beginning to end of your ceremony in order to carry away. So that was one of the, the number one responsibilities that I was told um, when I was, uh, I don't know what you would say, when I became aware um, of the, this responsibility that I had, again, speaking only for myself. Um, and so I was, and that was what I have spent um, a long time, and I still continue to do that. Um, I do have a tendency to do pretty much most of uh, the work that goes into preparing for a ceremony. Um, I do have a little bit of difficulty, I will, you know, admit to people, you know, asking for help kind of a thing. Um, it's kind of like better to just put my head down and get it done. Um, so a lot of it has been through, I don't want to say what they call trial and error. Uh, it was been through, and I wouldn't even say mistakes, but if there were mistakes that were made, as I was told that as long as we were in training, um, that mistakes were allowed. And that was the whole point. Um, and then I was also add, told further to that, as long as we're in training, it means that we can't really make any mistakes. So my point is, is that life every day is quote unquote in training. So we can't really make any mistakes. Um, that's the, again, this goes back to my own teachings. Um, so in terms of, of how we come to do these ceremonies um, today in current times, uh, again, I was also told that um, we had to adapt right to the times. Um, I recall uh, a gentleman, this is like about 30 years ago, coming up to me and saying to me one time, um, and this was a non-Indigenous person, uh, trying to be funny, I guess, is kind of what his, his point was. Uh, but anyhow, he came up to me one day and he's like, so you know what we're really missing these days, nowadays, and again, this is 30 years ago, um, and I'm like, do tell. And he's like, 
some real Indians. And I'm like, okay. And okay. All right. So uh, uh, what are you talking about? And he goes on to say his explanation was, you know, you know, those ones that lived in the bush, you know, those ones that live in teepees, you know, and like and live off the land and, you know, and they can they hunt and they, you know, chew their food and like whatever, all of this, chew their hides. And I'm kind of standing there looking at him. And then now mind you, this is like in the middle of the winter. Um, it was between Christmas and New Year's, I think. And so I'm like 20 minus 25 degrees outside. And there's this man trying to tell me, right, asking me, right, as an indigenous person, um, do tell, pray tell, where are all these real Indians? And then I looked at him and I'm like, um, you know what, this, I'm just kind of curious, right? Right now, this is my 25 degrees out, TP tarps, that's great, might have a fire, you know, kind of a thing, but also, right, not if I can, if I have a, uh, minus 40 quilt or comforter a coat right this is where it is that i'm going to go anyways my point was to this individual not quite sure what it was what what he what he meant by um real indians um because i'm not even sure of my that of that myself as well and so i know i'm jumping all around here a little bit i do have a point to all of this um and that's because and doing this work that we're doing at Native Women's, um, it's something that's ongoing. It's something that we continue to learn. Um, but I think if I was to speak for myself and say, honestly, what is truly what motivates me um, to do the work that it is that I'm doing, um, and it's, it's for the women. It's for the women who are yet to be, who are coming. It's for the women who are missing. It's for the families. It's for my daughter. It's for my mother. It's for my sisters. It's for your sisters. It's for your family. Um, because I was told that there's a term in Ojibwe and it's called Missinabi and it means no harm to women. And one of my teachers, uh, the late Mark Thompson, um, he was one of the ones that he, that was actually his name. And that was something that he had taught um, to all of us. And in particular, a, a group of people. And there was a reason for it because in English, it means no harm to women. And so over the years, um, and continuing along in my training as well, and still working with my teachers, that was one of the things that I was taught as well. So from my understanding is this is the prayer that, that I send out um, and I share that with you as well, that this is whenever I think and I worry about maybe my daughter um, or somebody that's missing and somebody that needs prayers um, and needs some safety and protection. If I physically can't be there, right? Which none of us are at any time, right? Anywhere where we need to be, especially when somebody really, really needs us and especially in a crisis. So what usually happens is, can you pray for me? Or you will automatically pray for that person and their safety. So I was told that this was one way when if I can't physically be there to go out and help somebody that asks and I, and I need to be, is to send that prayer out. And that prayer will go out. And I know that for a fact. And so my point is, is that and that's a very simple word, means a whole lot, right? And that's Mr. Nabi. But at the bottom line is no harm to women. That's what we're talking about. Women are sacred. We've known that. We've known this for a long time. This is what's coming forward. This is where we're going. This is the work that we're doing. This is the, the, the majority or the priority responsibility that I carry in the work that we do at Native Women's, in particular, these ceremonies. And why am I doing it? It's for that reason. It's for the women. And at this particular point, anything that I have learned um, in terms of teachings um, and training, uh, that sort of a thing, um, it was always there. And, but I just needed validation. Um, from other people, and that's what I call um, training, so to speak. Um, and so it's gotten to this point now where it's like I said, we just do it now. Um, and what we're being told through the ceremonies right now, I just finished uh, 30, number 34, I think, my 34th sweat. 
And so not being able to be out and around in the community um, as much as I would like to be in the meantime, what I have been doing with my time um, has been sweat. So um, I have been given instruction to do 49th. So I'm almost there. Well, I'm about like about maybe however many I didn't go to school for math. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we're going to need to do to keep going especially where it is that we're going. Uh, but for the purpose of today, I just wanted to explain that um, because I'm aware uh, of what's of going on in the community. And so I wanted to um, acknowledge that myself so you could hear it from me. And instead of going into bringing out my resume, uh, kind of a thing, um, but that is all of that is to explain my name, Jaushkom Dado Megize, the Spirit Eagle. I am Bear and Wolf Clan. I am from Neosh Chingaming First Nations, Cape, otherwise known as Cape Croker, uh, 51 winter, Winters in Anishinaabe Indau. And so, in a nutshell, I could have just said my name to you, and but nobody would have understood that part of it. What I just shared with you is the reason why I carry that name, Blue Spirit Eagle. And actually, I don't know if you can see this or not, but there's one just going. Hi there. So I wanted to, if you humor me for a minute, there was a song that I was given on um, my fast, and it was given to me by my grandpa. I'm only going to sing two rounds of it, which is very quick. Um, and the reason I'm singing this song is because this, the only English word that he could come up with, because uh, English was my grandpa's um, second language, or yeah, second language. And so when this song came and I didn't know the words for it, um, he told me what it was. And he made me sing it first before he told me. And at the end of it, he said it was forgiveness. And he said, any time that you need that for somebody, for yourself, um, and you don't have it or you don't have the words, you don't have the English words um, to speak to it, then you will sing this song. And with all the emotions that are in the air right now and in my own feelings, and especially on this particular day that we come together to honor, um, you know, our lost ones and missing and the families, um, this is kind of my gift to you. I don't normally do this and I'm still, I'm not on the road anywhere. So this is gonna be a lot um, for me to share this song. I'm only gonna sing a couple of rounds um so if my voice starts shaking just send me some positive vibes but the the song means forgiveness so whatever it is for you if you like bring shake the rattles um beat your drum that's great these guys are just going crazy over here and, the, and there's a whole bunch of um they're all cranes and all that are all getting together to fly down south so there's got to be about at least 75 to 100 and they just kind of circle around okay anyways i'm babbling so okay Love and everything surrounds you today during this vigil. Um, welcome and honor you and all those that are here and those that are missing. We pray for you. Continue to hold that light. Um, and just we'll hold you in our prayers. Um, and thank you for listening. Jimmy Glitch.
Thank you, Mary Ann. Thank you for sharing with us today as, as well as the prayer. Um, up next, we are going to have another performance by the All Nations Drum and a Jingle Dress performance with the honor song. So Kevin and those at the center today, can you please turn your cameras on for this portion? Thank you. Hey folks. <clears throat> Oops. Yes. <clears throat> so this song's gonna be uh, a jingle dress song. The song belongs to the Smoke Trail Singers. It was given to us about four years ago so we could sing this song for our jingle dress dancers. Are you first <laughs> Danny, thank you. Woo. All right. Thank you for that song and performance. Um, up next, we are going to have um, our NWRCT board member, Alana Roberts. She'll be sharing a few words with us today. So, Alana, 
Whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Tanchi Kiowa, hello everyone. Uh, thank you to our healers, dancers, and singers who are with us sharing all their gifts with us today. It's so moving to, to, see, to see you dance and hear your words and, and your song. So, merci for this. On behalf of the Native Women's Resource Center of Toronto's Board of Directors, I thank you for joining our virtual Sisters in Spirit vigil today. Today, we come together to remember the more than 4,000 missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit who have been taken from us. Each of these deaths and disappearances represents the life and spirit of a human being who is gifted and who is loved. Their absence causes each of our families, communities, and nations to be deprived of their love, their gifts, and all that they had to offer. This is a crisis and a genocide that impacts each of us and can be felt in every corner across the country. There are many patterns of violence that we can trace. This includes through human trafficking, where in Canada, the majority of cases are domestic in nature. While Indigenous women are 4% of the population, they make up over half of those who are trafficked, and one quarter of these are children who are under the age of 18. It is well documented that Indigenous youth leaving care are particularly targeted. There are also countless cases of individualized violence against Indigenous women that are indicative of greater systemic issues challenging our people. This includes Barbara Kentner, a 34-year-old mom from Wabagoon Lake Ojibwe Nation who was hit in the stomach by a trailer hitch by a man passing by in a car in Thunder Bay. Barbara never recovered from her injuries, and just a few months later, she died from them in 2017. This case continues to make its way through Canada's justice system three years later. The National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls found that ultimately, and despite the different circumstances and backgrounds of each of these deaths and disappearances, what connects all of them is colonial violence, racism, and oppression. We journey with the families and communities of our sisters in spirit to end all forms of violence against our people. The National Inquiry provides a roadmap forward. It details 231 calls for justice, spanning a wide range of sectors and calling for urgent action. The Native Women's Resource Center lives this work every single day. We thank Executive Director Pamela Hart, staff and volunteers who work tirelessly to carry this work to create safer communities for Indigenous peoples where each of us can flourish and live freely and fully. The leadership of Native women has carried seamlessly throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, ensuring that Indigenous women, girls, and Two-Spirit are never forgotten, that they are always made visible, and that they are always advocated for. This includes through supporting clients facing trafficking and violence, designing innovative programming to promote safety, including by developing a crisis hotline and maintaining community inclusion and connection by providing a wide range of programming, both online and safely in person. We thank Native Women for this work, which is led by Indigenous women for Indigenous women. It promotes safety and community, it strengthens connection to culture, and it enhances the self-determination of Indigenous peoples. We can all support the work of Native women and live our calls for justice every day. This is about knowing the calls that relate to your area of work and living those that call all Canadians to act. This includes reading the final report from the National Inquiry, learning about the land that you live on and the history of Canada, including as that history is told by Indigenous peoples. It's about calling out violence, racism, sexism, ignorance, homophobia, and transphobia against Indigenous peoples as it unfolds. It also centers on creating time and space for relationships based on respect as human beings, supporting and embracing differences with kindness, love, and respect. It's about transforming learning into allyship, promoting the safety of Indigenous peoples by respecting the value of each person, community, and nation. And it's about holding governments and institutional actors accountable for implementing their calls for justice. We each have a role to play in fostering safe communities for everyone and ending this crisis of violence. 
and it starts with our relationships with each other. We are grateful for organizations like Native Women's, which for decades have been leading the way and continue to show us the path forward. Kichi Marci and, and thank you. Thank you, Alana. Miigwech for being here with us today and sharing those words. On behalf of the Native Women's Resource Center of Toronto, Executive Director Pamela Hart is here to share some words with us as well. So Pam, you can turn on your mic and begin. Thank you, Christina. And thank you everyone for um, such impactful opening statements and songs and dances. Um, these days are always very hectic for us at the center, very emotional um, and very busy. And it always is uh, erased when um, those drums start and those words are spoken. So thank you. Um, my name is Pamela. I am also known as She Who Lights the Way. I am Muskrat Clan from Georgina Island. I am a Chippewa woman, mother of one, and a beyond honored person to hold the role of Executive Director with Native Women's Resource Centre of Toronto. Tonight we gather, and although it is at a distance, we gather connected to one another. We were designed and united to be resourceful, resilient, and distance will not and has not prevented us from our purpose. We are so grateful for everyone's participation in honoring tonight and creating medicine with us. I am reminded when I speak of distance, of remote highways, and it's important to note that missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls trans to us people, it is not a remote or distant issue. It is happening in our own cities, in our own yards. It is happening close to our homes and in our nations. It is happening in institutions and it is at the forefront of our media. It's happening in response to mental health checks, wellness visits, it's happening in hospitals. It's happening when our women are entering for safety, for wellness, and this has occurred in recent days. It's occurred in recent weeks and months and years and the evidence is that this is ongoing. Response to the recommendations of the inquiry report go unaddressed, and instead, they should be a priority of action. Tonight, our purpose is to honor, to acknowledge, and remember our stolen sisters, our lost spirits, to recall the value of Indigenous women. They are life givers, water protectors, and they are balanced. More importantly, they are sacred. Native Women's is working to remind and empower that message. Indigenous women are sacred. Tonight we are joined together by our youth, our juniors, our babies, our trans to us community, our staff, our community members, our men, women, non-binary friends, and we are all here to honor that message, that Indigenous women are sacred to send it out far and wide, to send love to the families who feel pain, who feel lost, to feel those emotions that can never be removed. We are here tonight to strengthen and to say no more stolen sisters. We are holding a sacred fire at Native Women's Resource Center. So if you have a name that you wanna honor or remember, we ask that you put that into the chat box and the staff will jot that down and provide it to the fire keepers and they will honor that name in ceremony um, on the grounds of Native women. Wherever you are, we ask that you light a candle or light your smudge, hold your, your sema, and remember those that you've lost. Remember that we are together. Remember that we are stronger, united. And I thank each and every one of you for taking a moment for yourself for each other, for our lost women. And I pray that we all stay strong, healthy, and united. Chi miigwech. Miigwech, Pam. Thank you for your words, your powerful words, and the meaning behind them. So up next, we are gonna have another performance by All Nations, as well as your Jingle Just, Jingle Just Dancer. And they are going to be doing a sidestep performance. So please direct your attention to Kevin and the youth group, as well as our jingle dress dancers. Okay, I'm going to start. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
that performance. Um, at this time, we would like to welcome our invited guest speaker, Robin Rice. Robin, if you'd like to join us now with your camera and tell us a little bit, us a little bit about yourself before you begin. Hello, I have a lot of colors on me. Um, as I was sitting here, I was feeling um, very, very emotional. I want to thank Mary Ann for that song, Forgiveness, because last night as I was sitting here, um, that's the word that kept on popping up to me is forgiveness. And that's forgiveness on myself and forgiveness on putting myself in per certain situations that I did. Um, so miigwech for that. My name is Robin Rice. Um, my spirit name is Wabish Gizi Miguan Kwe. I come from, um, Wabish Gizi Miguan Kwe is white feathered woman. Um, if you look on the eagle, the eagle has 13 feathers on the tail. And when you look at the 13th feather, it's the straightest feather because it gives the eagle balance. And yeah, so I'm still trying to, I'm, I'm understanding who I am as Robin Rice and white, white feathered woman. My great grandmother, Rosie Rice, my great great grandmother, Rosie Rice, who is a medicine woman who's from Wisoskin First Nations. Um, that's where my family is from. She's the one who gifted me with my spirit name as a baby. It was lost, um, well, not lost. Um, my mom forgot about it, which is okay. I ended up getting it at the age of 15 when I got sent away to a treatment center. And the reason why I got sent to a treatment center was because I was a high risk runaway um youth and yeah so my spirit colors my clan is nigig otter otter clan i was adopted by the loon clan from when i was 15 till about 33 i'm 35 right now and i do have a teen who who is a girl so i'm running through all these emotions of when i was a little girl and what i went through 
<clears throat> so I will be emotional, but I'm really good at clearing that away and I probably will bust out some tears a bit, but hey, this is for healing and and you know, I'm here to use my voice and speak and share my story. Um, something that I've closed my mouth on for the past whew, years upon years. Um, and now's the time. I've been approached by a lot of um, young women who were into escorting and, and human trafficking. And you know, I help on the side, on the private. I don't air it out. People don't know. But my mom is always leading me to help these young girls. and. And it is, it is, um, I do use my stories with them a lot. This is the first time I'm really just opening up about what I need to say. And I was really nervous about sharing my story because not only did I feel disgusting, um, I felt a lot of shame. I felt a lot of guilt. Um, I felt that if I were to share my story about human trafficking or the things that I used to do, um, I felt that people would really, really judge me in the community, but that's not what I've been getting. I've been getting the opposite. I've been getting people coming into my way to help me heal. And it's, it's really good because now is the time for all of us to heal. And, and because my daughter is at the age of 14, um, I share my experiences with her because when I was young, I was abused at the age of seven. And I remember when my mom asked me, asked me if I was abused, I said, no, I lied to her. And that's when I realized I lost my trust in not only my family, but I lost trust in myself and who I was. I didn't understand how to have a relationship with a man because all I seen was abuse. All I witnessed was this whole thing of, of, of women being sexualized, not even realizing, realizing the history that had happened to our people and um, through colonization. Um, I never realized that, but here I am being able to share um, my experiences. I wanted to start off with a poem that I, I kept closed for a long time. And the reason why I kept it closed was because it was so harsh for me to even, even think about. It's called pain. Sorry, everyone, give me a minute. I'm feeling the pain, so feeling ashamed of the pain, so scared of the beat, couldn't leave due to punches to the face and the rage in his eyes as he called me a disgrace. Turned to smashing and dashing, leaving me crying and slowly dying, not knowing whether I'm just grieving or not breathing. Time and time again, I sit here scared, telling myself this just isn't fair. Why me? Why now? Why did I let this asshole break me down? Not feeling the pain, not feeling ashamed of the pain. Gonna tell this asshole, let's play this fucking game. He will feel the pain towards the end of the game as he's holding my hand and wishing I weren't dead. Time's up, I win. I now know you feel the pain. I now know you feel the pain that you gave as I was torn away. <sighs> so I wrote that poem because 13 years ago, I was lost with my words. I didn't know how to express myself. I didn't know how to express the pain that I adored through being in gang violence, um, sex trafficking, um, the abuses, the rapes. Um, I was also a child who is in CAS from the age of 12. My grandmother is a 60 scoop survivor and my great grandmother is a day school survivor. And some of the stories that I've heard is, I've seen that circle go around, you know? I've witnessed that circle go around in the family. I was the only child, so I grew up watching a lot of things. <clears throat> so I have been through a lot 
and I could name off so much things, but it's just way too traumatic. And, you know, that poem is just something that I had to talk about because that explains a lot of the pain that I've been through. Though a lot of the pain that I witnessed, that wasn't just for me writing it for myself. It's what I witnessed. It's also something that when I didn't know how to express myself, writing it on paper was the only way, but a lot of my writing was negative. So as I was in CAS, I ended up, um, I ended up getting abused and left in front of two houses. Um, I woke up and I was naked. I went to a wedding, I snuck out of the group home. Like I said, I, the group homes couldn't keep me down. Um, and I woke up walking to my group home in the morning, naked on the street. Luckily it was down the street. Well, I shouldn't say luckily, I'm feeling nervous. So these words that are coming out is a little bit, um, not even should be used. But it was very, it was very depressing knowing that this could happen, knowing that I didn't remember what had happened. And the first thing I thought about was how, the first thing I thought about was that I was being watched over by somebody because that wasn't the first time I was raped or abused and left there. And I thought about the times when I would run away from home and sometimes I would be at men's houses and if I didn't sleep with them, they'd kick me out. So I'd walk down, down all the way, like two hours away from my area. I grew up in the High Park and Bloor area. I actually live in, lived in the building, 100 High Park. There was a lot of trauma and a lot of hurt, just even on the lands is hurt in general from the past. And I would always go sit in a park. The park was called Lithuania Park. It was a park that I grew up in. This park had a lot of memories for me, good memories. It was like my protector. I felt like I had this like aura around me all the time. I would go sleep on the bench and I know I was well protected, but there was some times when I didn't feel so protected that I had to really, really sit and talk to myself. And why did I put myself in the gang life? Why did I put myself on the street? Why did I think it was okay to escort? When I started going, I go to University of Toronto now, I dropped out of school when I was 15 years old, but now I'm in the transitional year program. When I went there, I started relearning the culture's history because I'm in Indigenous studies. I started, I started understanding the past of my, my grandmothers, um, the past of my families, and I started not being so angry at them because I was angry with my family, very angry. I was so angry, but I love my mom, I love my grandma, I love all the women because they were so strong. They, they showed me how to survive. And that was what I wanted to say was, I was on survival mode. I went to Lee Miracle at University of Toronto and I walked in her room after a year and a half being in her in, in, at the school. Something drew me to her that one day, so I introduced myself. I ended up working on childhood trauma. I actually ran away from a session because I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't deal with that hurt and just the memories that are sitting there that I keep on locking up in my stomach. And I could feel the sickness in my stomach because all these things that had happened are also sicknesses and I keep that locked up. But just recently I've been able to, people have been coming my way. People have been coming my way and, and hearing my stories and wanting me to share and you know, I love sharing, I love speaking, I love educating. And one thing that I really love doing is I love my youth. I love working with them. That's something that I've done. I've always worked in childcare and I've always worked as a, as, um, a youth mentor. And so when I walked in the office, Lee Miracle noticed that all I was using was negative words and it was a lot of negative words put towards myself. I used to blame myself for all these rapes that happened, saying that, no, I was just drinking. No, I deserve to go through that. No, nobody does. No, 
no, no, no, we don't deserve to go through that. And it really sucks how colonization has made it so, it, oh, the way I want to say it, like, I can't even say that right now, but it just sucks the way colonization back in the day had made it seem like it's okay for Indigenous people or Indigenous women to get prostituted when colonizing came. And I'm talking more on the British side when they came. And the reason why I brought up that was because my first story at University of Toronto was about Chief Wabakaninin. And Chief Wabakaninin um, had a daughter, or no, a sister, sorry. And they were out salmon, salmon hunting. They sold salmon and stuff. They came back to a spot over at the St. Lawrence Market. And th she ended up going into a place and having, setting down her salmon and putting it aside. And she was approached by a British guy. I can't remember his name on top of my head, but he would, they went to court and stuff for it. My teacher, Jill Carter, said, Robin, please do not please do not write that story. She's like, you're not healed. I'm like, no, no, I could do it. I could do it. I could do it. Nope. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I, I actually ended up getting stuck at the part, part of the chief's sister um, was either missing or they killed her. But that story wasn't told. That story wasn't told at all. So when she went to this bar, the the guy ended up approaching her, talking to her about, um, I'll give you alcohol and one dollar if you come back and sleep with me. She said no. So he went to the camp and found her while she was under a canoe. The chief Wabakanini, I hope I'm saying it right. I've been practicing that word like in 2018. But the chief and his wife ended up coming out and hearing her screams they ended up passing away because of how much they got hit, how much they got beat. So I just didn't understand where was her story? Where was that girl? Where was that girl's story? Why wasn't that told? The case ended up getting dismissed, which is really shitty. Those cases, I don't know about that. But I got stuck on that. And then after that, I decided to go to... Um, a conference at University of Toronto and it was about human trafficking and that was the first day that I opened up about my story and I received an eagle feather from Sue Smoke that day and it was so honoring because I didn't think that I would ever get a white feather knowing that my name is white feathered woman but it came out all in the right spot I still locked up my stories inside but just recently, I started coming out and talking about it more, and I'm feeling more comfortable at speaking these stories. I have a friend who calls me a sister, a survival, um, I can't even remember the word. Um, sorry, I just got a brain fart right now. I have someone who calls me a survivor, and at first I didn't understand what a survivor meant. I was like, no, I'm not a survivor. I'm definitely not a survivor. But I think it was because I just didn't understand the words and I didn't want to classify myself as a survivor because I didn't understand. Like, I didn't think I survived anything. And then I made a call to one of my friends that I grew up with. And he was the one when I was younger who thought I was going to end up dead or in jail because I was not only violent, I was violent towards men. I was really violent towards men. I would even rob them when I was younger because I had no trust in them whatsoever, like whatsoever. And I kind of, you know, I'm working on that now, getting back in the community. I've met a lot of great people and a lot of people are, are surviving just as much as I am and just even learning the culture. So my friend reminded me about how much I have survived. And I just sat there crying and crying and crying. And I just couldn't stop crying. I had to remember all the guns that got put to my head at a certain time and how many times I've came out alive and how many times I've seen things. And I'm just really grateful. I'm really, really grateful. At first I was not grateful for my life, but now I am because I'm here to share my stories, my experiences 
we sit here and there's so much missing women still missing and there's so much abuses behind closed doors and you know there's so much cries out there that we're not hearing and you know i just i want to be that woman to make a difference in other young women's lives not even women just everybody you know we all have a story we all have a teaching and this is these are our gifts these are our gifts to share and i'm happy that i was able to be here and share some of these stories um yeah i am also wearing purple today for joyce i wasn't able to go out today and i was upset with myself about that but we also have to remember that self-care is a must too right as much as we could go out and work for the community our prayers are always strong enough as well and yeah i remember a couple months back this is when i first became on my healing my journey in my back I, this is when I started really healing was back in 2016. I lived in a building and the people downstairs, this is after when I was done my gang days, my, um, this was after, way after when I was done being on the streets and, you know, getting myself into situations that I wasn't supposed to. And when we, when in 2016, I was working at a daycare and I was, I was working at daycares for 15 years before that. So I was constantly around kids. I had these really, really um, hurt neighbors and they were getting themselves into gang, um, drug, uh, a lot of stuff. And I ended up, my house ended up getting raided, which was really shocking to me because I stopped that gang life long time ago. How are they coming to raid my house? and especially with my daughter um my daughter was 12 at the time when i heard the words mommy are you gonna die mommy are you gonna die when they put the big gun towards me i thought i was gonna die too and hearing that coming from my daughter's mouth made me realize how much healing i need to do for a lot of the shit that i was put through at her age and those cries for help that my daughter gave were the same cries of help that I needed for myself at those times. So my daughter really helped push me to get that healing. And now I've been on this journey. I'm still angry at those cops. I will still never forget what they did and how they treated me and my daughter. But I also remember that I'm kind of thankful for this experience because it continues me to be stronger in my voice it continues me to help other individuals that have been through the same situation like with these raids or the systematic racism that's going on you know i was even pushed out of cars and i thought i was gonna die on a highway one day like there was so much stories but i'm here to share these and i'm glad that i am it's such a painful time, but as I'm speaking, I could actually feel the healing in my stomach. I could feel the weight being lifted off of my shoulders right now. And it's such a warm feeling. I don't think I've had warm feelings like I've been having in the past couple of months. And I think those are more of, I love myself feelings. And I'm really honored to be here and share the story. Um, I think that's pretty much what I have to say. I could ramble on so, so, so much, um, but it's kind of like wearing me out now. And I think, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I have to say. I want to say miigwech to everybody and I want to say miigwech for inviting me. Um, I've also been jingle dressing, dancing as well, which at the beginning was also healing, definitely healing for me. and. I've been recently starting to come back out into the community to, to advocate more for missing, murdered Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit and trans. Um, I'm still learning and I don't push myself to do things until I'm really, really ready. But as long as people could hear my voice, hear my story, and I could continue just being there when I can, then that's what I'm here for. Watch everybody. Robin. Robin for sharing with us. 
um, we want to sing a song in honor of your story. So everyone with drums and rattles, please feel free to join us. Marianne, it's gonna start it. All right. There she is. Robin, this is Pamela. I just wanted to um, personally thank you for sharing your story and your power and your wisdom and your knowledge. Um, you are the epitome of power and grace and your voice and your message and your existence is so important to every single person on this call and beyond. And you sharing and being the woman you are for your daughter means your future, her future, our community will be stronger as a whole in the days and future to come. And I can't be any more honored and touched and privileged to have been a part of just hearing hearing you speak. So thank you, miigwech. And with that, Marianne, um, we're asking everyone if you have drums, rattles, anything, you're welcome to unmute and enjoy, uh, join us in song. I guess, okay, there, okay. God, I love this. Okay. Uh, first of all, Robin, oh my goodness, I'm sending you hugs. Um, this is one of the hardest things I would have to say about the COVID. Um, it's been a long, long history and a long, long time before we ever got to a place, as you were mentioning in your story, um, about those, those, those positive, those, those things that were always there for us, that were good things, um, but we were, we were taught a different way. Um, basically what I would call what they were taught, we were taught how to use them as a weapon. So when you gave that story about the feather, um, absolutely, you know, the story of the two wolves, those two sides, right? There's always a flip side to everything. Our history is that we've only been taught the one side, right? And the, minus the other part of it, what it would have explained a lot of things and which is explains who you are and why you're here. Um, and I'm so extremely grateful um, for having you here and thanking you for sharing that story because you're right. You know, the, 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 the reality is that is the basis of a lot of our history. I know for myself, I share a similar history in terms of childhood, right? And asking all those questions as well um, and continue to ask those questions and continue to push myself. And as you have been to be that example, um, to be that, that light for your daughter, because somewhere inside of us, we knew that this was not who we were. This other culture out there was trying to, to control us and trying to, um, just just take a hold and brainwashing, right? We just have to look at social media and we know where all of this stuff is coming from. So bringing it back to roots, which is the self, it begins with you and that's you, right? This is what it is that you're showing your daughter. So not only did you break that cycle, but continue to push yourself in spite of everything that was in your mind and all of those influences to continue to bring that healing forward. Uh, it's such a, such a powerful, powerful journey. And I know that I'm grateful and glad that you pushed through and that you're here and you're sharing the story. Don't ever be ashamed of the words that you use. What we have to use is the words that we have, but this is why we have these things. And I was always told why um, these songs, some of them don't have words. It's because there is no words for some of that pain that goes that deep. And all we can do is to bring it out to the light to creator so creator can help us with that. And if it comes out in a sound, that's why we have songs in the first place. Um, so I wanted to thank you for that. So truly from the bottom of my heart, like I said, I owe you a thousand hugs, a million hugs if I was there. And so when I do get a chance to see you again, this is going to be one of the things that I'm going to hug you for um, because I'm so extremely proud of you and I'm proud of of all of the things that you've accomplished and even your family and even challenging those belief systems, right? Because you're right. A lot of our people that ahead of us did their part, right? And like every, every generation that takes that forward um, does their part to take it forward. It's the job of the next generation coming along behind to pick up that piece and continue it further. And that is what we're doing for our daughters, okay? So I wanna thank you. So you're such a blessing and an inspiration. And you also gave me inspiration to do this song. Um, um, and, and my voice will probably start shaking. There might be a few ah, squawks, but that's okay. I'm doing, I'm doing this for you. 
uh, because I love you and appreciate and thank you. So it's a strong woman song. Um, I'm kind of proud of myself for that. That's a really quite the song to, uh, you know, to, to learn. Uh, Maggie Paul, from my understanding, is the one who brought that song to this area. So we acknowledge her as well um, and give thanks to that. So I'm going to do four rounds of that. And so, um, but yeah. So, and if I close my eyes, I'm not trying to offend anybody. It's just that I can't see you all. Okay. All right. So. May we invite you to do another jingle for us, please? Kevin? Kevin, are you there? Hey, can you our dancers? Awesome. Okay, guys. <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> 
for that, that song, thank you. We are gonna have the Native Women's Resource Center Toronto's trauma support peer worker, Bella Reynolds, share a few words with us today. So Bella, if you're ready, you can come on camera and begin. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bella. I'm a trans peer um, worker here at Native Women. And today, I just like to take a, a moment to honor these women on this poster behind me. I'm going to call it their names. The first one is Laura Wells, and she was murdered um, last year. She's one of my trans sisters. Karen Connolly, Grace Baxter. Sean Jr. was killed 25 years ago by uh, a client that is uh, 
He's done his jail term. He's getting released shortly. Um, Patricia Carpenter. Bella, Sean Alexander, Shannon Alexander, Tanya Hill. Tina Fontaine. Kevin Tavers, H2 was murdered. Misty, Cassandra Doe was also um, a very close friend to me that was murdered by, by, by a trick. Um, also, Joanne Mary LaRoche. Uh, she was the mother of a dear close friend of mine. I also like to take this time to um, acknowledge the team of staff I work with as a Native woman. We come together every year, October 4th, to, uh, to do Sisters of Spirits. Last year, the march we had in the park was led by um, the trans community. I also like to acknowledge um, Tiffany Mercer. Last week, she, was, she went missing. Uh, last Sunday, I reached out to a friend and asked, um, if she heard any word, we heard that she passed away in the hospital due to health complications. And I also like to um, honor the other women, I mean, some of our clients that have passed on prematurely or from health complications. Brandy, um, there was Donna, Donna's friend. And um, some of the two two spirited um, community members that have passed away. I was just informed the other day that um, a two spirited community member passed away. His name was Everett. So we lost many women in a two spirited people in our community. I was going to recite a poem, but I'll just tell you a bit about my story and where I come from. Where I am today. I started three years here at Native Women's Resource Center of Toronto as a trans peer worker. I'm going into my fourth year. I'm a former sex worker. In 2018 or 2019, I was uh, a victim of violence and assault. I come so far and and who I am today. I struggle like everybody else. And as I stand in the circle of cedar and these glass stars that are going to like candle moon. And in front, there's a bouquet of roses of different colors, peach and red and white that I had brought for those women that are still missing or murdered. The other night I was sitting at home watching TV and I looked in my room and I see two red eyes. I don't know where it came from. So I lit a smudge and I asked the creator to write to guide that spirit or whoever comes to visit me to go on your way, have a safe journey. I got up, I walked in, I checked my bed. There was no light, there was nothing there. So I'm very blessed that maybe somebody come to me and visit from the spirit world to let me know that they've crossed safely and they're happy. But you know, this, this time during COVID-19, I've lost some family, family members. Um, I lost my aunt, she was 82 years old. I can't, I lost my cousin-in-law, he had cancer. 
the detail when you're called, uh, just be on five kids. And I also want to take this time to acknowledge um, two of my cousins that are uh, residential school, school survivors, um, Judy Jameson and Sue Williams, and also my uncle, um, Laird Hendrick, who was also a school survivor. And I just also like to take this time to um, thank you all for coming on Zoom, taking time out of your Sunday afternoon. I want to say a miigwech to all our drummers for taking time and the dancers. Um, our dancers were at another event, so we made it on time. Um, just just before we started today, I um, I smoked my pipe in the, in the circle, and I shared that smoke with the poster. It's one of them are still missing or murdered. Um, what else? And I'd like to say, again thank the team of uh, the management, ED, um, our new trauma support uh, coordinator for coming on board with this event. And again, I just want to thank you all for the bottom of my heart with which stay safe, be well, wash your hands, you know, <laughs> cover that face. <laughs> There's no need for COVID-19. Um, may the creator watch over you on your path. You know, after we leave here today, just remember that you're loved and created watching. Okay. Thank you, Bella. Thank you for sharing with us today. So at this time, we are going to light a candle to remember our lost and stolen women, girls, trans, and two-spirit loved ones. We also want to acknowledge and honor their families who are affected daily with their losses and the unknown. Today and every day before and after, we honor and remember. Join us by lighting your own candle if it can be done so safely and we are going to have a moment of silence. All right. All right. We will begin our moment of silence now. So at this time, we are going to invite our dancers and our drummers at Native Women's to perform the water song. Oh. 
we invite everyone to join together on the traveling song. This will be led by the All Nations Drum Group as well as Paige and Sarah. If you have your drums, have them ready and you're more than welcome to sing along with us as well. Mary, get up. Folks, <laughs> Yeah. You chose to sing the AIM song, right? Uh, because uh, during that time when AIM came about, AIM gave the people something. They gave them that pride. Right? They taught the people how to stick together. And if we do things together as a people, we we can accomplish lots, right? So this, uh, this whole visual is about our missing and murdered indigenous women, right? And uh, if we uh, stay together and we work together, we, we can do something about this. The same song here is for that bit of a traveling too. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Everybody, thank you, Native Women's Resource Center, for inviting us out to sing for the Missing and Murdered uh, Women's Vigil. It was a great honor for our All Nation Juniors to be able to do something great, a good in the community like this. So, thank you for having us out, guys, ladies. On behalf of the Native Women's Resource Center of Toronto, I want to thank you all for joining us today and for our 2020 Virtual Sisters in Spirit Vigil. Today we came together as a community in unity to love, honor, and to remember. Stay well, stay safe. <laughs>